I'm Mike Quaranta. I'm president of the Delaware State Chamber of Commerce, and we're excited for our next session, uh, which is going to feature uh, Ted Abernathy. Ted is with the, he's the managing partner of the economic leadership uh, firm in Raleigh, North Carolina. He's got a broad range of professional experience. Um, a couple highlights that jumped out at me is he spent uh, 10 years in the mid-Atlantic region working for the city of Baltimore and doing things in and around Maryland. Um, uh, quite wisely, he picked a spouse from uh, Baltimore. Uh, he is an alum of Johns Hopkins University. Um, and so without further ado, he's going to talk to us about how Delaware positions itself and what its standing and rank is in the region. As we think about at the chamber, how we uh, compete against our neighbors, it's really important for us to have a clear understanding of where our strengths are and where our challenges are. And um, we asked Ted to identify some of those data points because those will in turn inform us uh, and you can't fix that which you don't measure. Um, so he's gonna walk us through some key indicators and I think it's gonna be very revealing, uh, helpful, maybe a bit sobering in part, but I think what it does is it will help shape our thinking and give us a series of solid agenda items and to-dos as we move forward. So um, very interested to hear how we rate in our neighborhood um, and even nationally from time to time. So. Uh, Ted, uh, we're very anxious for this session and uh, thank you for joining us. Mike, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the introduction and the ability to be with you today. Um, our firm is lucky enough to work for about a dozen of the state chambers around the country and so we do a, a lot of work on a daily basis of comparing numbers with people, uh, both current numbers and trend lines and also where things are headed in the future. So today we're going to look closely at Delaware and how it works with its neighbors, but also what some of the trends are for the state. Uh, we'll go back about 10 years and try to figure out where the momentum is. We'll talk about the present, and then we'll also talk a little bit about the future, what we think uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is going to do to uh, local economies in terms of trends that might happen with that. So we start back just looking at 10-year averages of everybody in the country, and I know these are busy slides. The good news is the way that you've set up this conference, people can look at these uh, and try to get a little better handle on them. We look at three major things to, to do the economy, to look at the economy above all else. Uh, the first is just job growth. And so among the 51 states, the District of Columbia gets counted uh, as a state in the way you do data so that you can include it. Uh, Delaware ranks 21st, uh, outperforming its neighbors of Maryland, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania over the last 10 years, but actually underperforming the national average of about 15%. So all of the neighborhood that you're in actually grew slightly less than the nation. When you look at average wages, uh, Delaware performed slightly better than New Jersey, but it was behind uh, both Maryland and Pennsylvania and ranked 37th overall. Uh, not one of its best rankings. And then when you look at the GDP, the uh, gross domestic product of the state, the overall economy, uh, Delaware actually performed worse than each of the three neighbors and significantly worse than the national average. Uh, overall GDP growth nationally was about 25% uh, and Delaware's was about 5%. So a mixed bag on those three major indicators. We, uh, that's 10 year, if we, take that down to the last five years or the last 12 months. And I always, when I'm presenting to groups, tell people the last 12 months data is fun to look at, but it's gonna be updated a couple times. So you take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Uh, you can see that overall uh, job growth has been pretty consistent. Uh, wage growth got a little better last year, but the overall economic growth, the economy, the GDP growth has been consistently uh, low in uh, Delaware for the last 10 years. If you look at your neighbors just for a few minutes, uh, just to give them a, a, a second here, um, New Jersey's job growth has been improving slightly. Their wage growth has stayed about the same. Uh, and GDP growth, again, in, in the lower half of states, but pretty consistent. This is Maryland's. A lot of numbers, as you see, in the middle of uh, 
of the country's rankings. And then finally, Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania is actually slightly more consistent than everybody else and job growth right in the middle. The neighborhood hasn't been one of the fast growers. Y'all probably are aware of that. Uh, and Delaware's performance is mixed compared to its neighbors. To drill in a little bit closer, the, the question is what's been happening over that 10 years? And this is Delaware's uh, GDP by sector. You can see that uh, overwhelmingly you're dominated by the financial activity sector. You knew that, but that's 43% of your GDP. Uh, manufacturing, a little bit less than 8%. Business and professional services, about 10 The real question is what happened over the last 10 years? And so if you go to 2019, this is the data. Uh, it looks pretty similar. Uh, there's been gains, so overall weight of GDP in the financial services sector, the health sector, and the construction sector, all three very important to the state, and losses. So less of your GDP now comes from manufacturing, from government, and from trade, transportation, utilities. So while they're not huge swings, you're beginning to see the economy change a little. Uh, and those numbers don't mirror national averages. They're very unique to what's happening in Delaware. The GDP is a number that we look closely at, and your GDP per capita. So um, just as a, as a quick reminder, when people look at GDP growth in some fast-growing states like in the South or the West, they might see pretty strong GDP growth, but part of that is because they're growing their population pretty quickly. And so as more people move in, the overall economy grows, but the actual performance of the individuals is not something that gets measured that way. So we look at GDP per capita, and the good news on the chart on the left is that uh, Delaware still is about 10% above the national average in GDP per capita. The bad news is that over the last five years, that position has been losing ground, while the national GDP per capita output is about 9.4%, or if you think about it, about 2% a year, Delaware's has actually dropped a little during that period of time. And so you're, you're moving away from the bar that you're trying to get to. Why that matters so much is this chart. And this is a 50-state a chart. It shows uh, two numbers. It shows how your GDP per capita measures up against your personal income. And so why GDP per capita matters is there's a correlation between the output of the individual citizen and how much personal wealth they have, how much income they have. And you can see that's a, that's a very strong correlation up at the far top end. The people with the most output, states with most output, have the highest salaries, New York, Massachusetts, California, Washington. Down at the bottom, places that don't produce as much and have lower wages, Alabama, Arkansas, West Virginia, Mississippi, those things make sense. Delaware's in the middle of this, uh, on, the, on the higher side of, of GDP per capita, as we said, but maintaining that output is a key for the state in order to keep wages high, personal income high. As you look over the last five years, just drill down a little, there have been some changes in the industry sectors for the state. Uh, lots of growth in the healthcare sector and the accommodation and food service sector some losses of white collar jobs in the professional, scientific, and technical sector, uh, and everybody else growing a little bit, but the economy is shifting a little. And uh, when we first looked at this, we thought that the, the key was to notice where the shifts were happening. So if you start measuring current competitiveness, which is uh, what Mike asked me to look at, we look at a bunch of different factors. Uh, when site selectors are looking at where, the, where they ought to make investments, uh, this is the latest survey of those site selectors and what they care the most about. So highway accessibility always shows up near the top. A company doesn't want to move somewhere where they don't have the ability for their employees to get there or to move their goods and services. And then right after that, two, three, and four are all issues of people, of talent. So the availability of skilled labor, what that labor cost a company, and then quality of life, which was never in the top 15 or 20 until just the last few years, because that quality of life now is considered a key factor for attracting the labor that people need. So people are really important, they're at the top. Then come a whole series of things, occupancy costs, tax rate, energy costs, exemptions, regulations, proximity to markets, 
So when you think about it, cost is always going to matter. People are always going to matter. And the infrastructure needed to support the business is always going to matter. So when we start talking about what's competitive and what's not, we try to look back at those factors that are the most important to companies. Thinking about labor, one of the key issues is that we are slowing our great labor growth in the country. The last few years have been some of the slowest growth that we've ever seen in labor force. And this is the projected population change for the next 10 years. And these are the states, uh, this is just for working age population, 25 to 64. And you can see a lot of the country is expecting labor to be tighter. There'll be limited growth in those areas or negative growth. So uh, Delaware is not one of the states that is expecting the most population growth in that, uh, in that cohort between 25 and 64, but it is not expecting to grow. And so not having your labor force grow unless something change is going to be an issue. It's going to reduce your competitiveness overall. Now, uh, these are, when we start talking about projections, one of the things that's really important to think about is these are projections based on the way things are today. COVID-19 is going to change some things, but also anything you do to change is going to impact this in the future. So we've seen states where projections turned out to be really wrong uh, and other places where they're, they're spot on. The West and the South still continue to attract a lot of working age people, uh, but trying to get to a point where your working age population is stable in your state is the first key. Uh, productivity of the population is also important. Uh, companies want to move where there's a productive workforce, and as you can see in the green bar here, uh, Delaware well above the national average in productivity. We measure that in the output per thousand workers. Some of that is related to the type of economy you have, what you do in your state. Some of it is related to the quality and training of the workforce. So you're looking at a national average uh, of 102, you're at 123, so almost 20% better productivity than the nation. But again, over the last few years, press productivity has gone up around the country, your productivity in Delaware has begun to shrink a little. And so this is another area to look at. I would dig a little deeper and try to figure out if that's because of the industry mix that's changing in the state or whether or not it's the output, the, the training, the education of the individual workers. As your industry mix has changed recently, it's probably having as much impact on this as anything. Now, one of, the, one of the issues people talk about a lot is how manufacturing jobs have left the U.S. And we certainly have fewer jobs. This goes back uh, about 30 years and looks at manufacturing jobs and manufacturing output. This is the national numbers. So while we have fewer people but working manufacturing, about 30%, we have about 70% more output. So we manufacture much more than we used to manufacture, but with fewer people. When you add Delaware's in there, you have actually greater job losses in manufacturing, but not quite the type of productivity gains as the rest of the country. Again, mix of uh, industries are a big part of this, but it's also that productivity uh, uh, stagnation that we've seen in the last few years. I looked at manufacturing jobs a little closer just to see where the gains and losses have been, because overall they're, they're pretty stable. Um, and you've added a lot of jobs in food processing, some in machinery, plastics, and rubber. Uh, the losses have been in primary metals, transportation equipment, and the big one in chemicals and uh, related probably to pharmaceuticals. And so looking closer at those industries to see if that mix is the answer is a key for understanding uh, both what your competitiveness uh, changes are, but also what to do about it. A very busy chart. Let me explain it to you. Every year we do work for manufacturing associations around the country. And uh, one of our clients, and we're just, you get the benefit of one of our clients, uh, you know, having us do this, they have their uh, manufacturing uh, CEOs tell us what's the most important things to them. And they pick 50 factors each year and we put them in indexes uh, on the business climate, on workforce, infrastructure, how much innovation and how much economic strength. And then we measure the states. Now your, your state, your manufacturers might pick a different set of uh, indices that they want to look at or different factors. But when we started looking at this, we found that 
Uh, Del Delaware was 38 in, in our last uh, evaluation. State scores really high for infrastructure, but the overall business climate doesn't show real well, 44th among states. And so there are issues that you can break that down, see where the business climate gives you a disadvantage in places where your legislature, your government sector, legal sector, regulatory, all of those things that could be improved could move you up that list, and put you on a more short list for new job growth. We also look every year to see about all the rankings, uh, states that uh, get ranked as the best place by this organization or that, uh, Forbes, CNBC, Chief Executive are some of the ones that get the most attention each year. And, uh, but we wanna see if that actually matters. So we plot it against the performance of the state. We look at the job growth, the wage growth, uh, the GDP growth, and we use a three-year average for both the X, the NY axis here so that we have a little, we can smooth out one year things. Then we plot it to see um, are the places that are rated the best, do they actually have the highest performance? If you look at the chart down in the, the green box on the lower left are the states that everybody ranks as the best places to do business. And it also, you can see those are also the places that statistically are doing the best. So Arizona, Idaho, Colorado, Utah, Texas, Florida, North Carolina, Nevada end up in that box. Up in the top uh, right are the places that are usually ranked low by these type of polls and they're multi-factor polls and they also don't perform real well. And so you can see that New Jersey is in there, uh, Maryland, uh, Delaware is one of those places that uh, sort of 35th, you saw your rankings uh, before, but you actually are rated by the site selectors is slightly better than that. So your, your performance is slightly worse than your overall ranking. Uh, does image mean everything? No, it doesn't. Uh, and certainly places that you know, have higher rankings or lower rankings have strengths and weaknesses just like anywhere else. But you can look at these multi-factor analysis and try to figure out where the areas are that need improvement for any state. We also looked at tech jobs and um, we do tech work for quite a few states and how they're growing. One of the surprises for a lot of elected officials when we talk about technology is that every state's not growing their tech work. Uh, you think that technology is growing everywhere, but uh, if you divide technology into sectors uh, and you uh, have, I think it's 87 different technical codes, national codes that qualify as tech, uh, over the last five years, the United States added about 8% to the overall tech uh, industry. Uh, Delaware lost about 13%. This is a significant finding when we look at it. Um, the expected growth, our projections for the next five years, also places Delaware in the lower half of, uh, of what's going to happen in the country. Technology is concentrating in some places, and uh, those places are heavy into technical training. They're trying to have tax systems and regulatory systems that support the technology industry. And uh, this is an area that offers some real chance for improvement for the state. Another way of looking at industries is to use uh, the Brookings Institute's uh, definition for advanced industries. So this includes both services and manufacturing that are in more advanced industries. So uh, some of the things that might fall in there would include aviation or automotive, it would include uh, biologicals, but it would also include service industries uh, like legal or finance. Uh, the states that are leading here, and this measures both the growth in advanced industry and the growth in advanced industry jobs and GDP, are up there in the right. Again, some of those places that uh, showed up other, pla other places, Washington, Florida, North Carolina, um, down at the bottom, uh, Alaska and Oklahoma. But this is also a place where Delaware's advanced industries aren't growing as fast. And it's another place to look for uh, opportunities for improvement. Uh, I also just pulled up house prices. Uh, I know that house prices seem pretty, uh, pretty high in Delaware sometimes, but not compared to surroundings. Uh, the growth in house prices sometimes is a representation of how strong the economy is. Nationally, over the last five years, house prices have gone up almost a third. Uh, Delaware, only 14%. So that helps you in affordability. 
but it hurts uh, building local wealth before you sell that. Uh, it's something to keep in mind. Um, we look at hundreds of factors. I pulled a few out. Some of the areas that would concern me and I would look at is that while your population continues to grow, it's aging. Uh, as it's aging, an aging population is less productive. Younger workers tend to be uh, better at dealing with automation and uh, with new technologies, and they tend to be slightly more productive coming straight out of school. Uh, in those first group of years, your population aging is probably one of the reasons that your um, overall productivity has been impacted. Your healthcare spending is 20% higher than the national average, and your violent crime rates are higher than the national average. On the positive side, uh, when we talked about the business climate, your legal climate is one of the best, rated as one of the best in the country. Uh, you are not losing population and jobs like a lot of people uh, in, the, in the Northeast or in the Midwest, and that puts you in a position that you're able to, to take a position of strength and move forward. Uh, and your medium household income is still well above the national average, uh, signifying that you've got citizens with means. You do not have the uh, poverty concerns, the deep poverty concerns that some places do in the country. That doesn't minimize the fact that there are people in need in Delaware, but that that, that overall median household income is still a strength. So third part of this is looking toward the future just a little. And uh, we wanted to, to talk a little about the fact that there are a lot of jobs at risk for automation. There's been a lot of stories and uh, research done in the last three or four years talking about the probability of automation. Uh, some of those are very scary stories. Uh, there have been some to suggest that up to 40% of jobs could be automated within the next 10 to 20 years. The ones that I take a little more stock in are, are that 40% of the task could be automated. It might not change jobs, but it will mean that every job is going to have a bigger uh, automation role as we go forward. But a lot of the jobs that are going to be automated are in office support and food prep and production in areas that might become important to, uh, to you as you look at where your occupations are. So we looked at uh, the states most vulnerable to automation. You're in the middle. You're not one of the most. You see a lot of the north, uh, the Northeast is in the green or green and yellow area. The West, where there is a lot of mining, uh, energy use, uh, agriculture, and the, the South, where there's less uh, manufacturing of advanced stature, but some older style manufacturing are in the most uh, danger. So a really, again, complicated chart, sorry for this, but we looked, and there's gonna be three of these. Uh, we looked at the types of jobs growth that you've had over the last 10 years. And we did it by education. So these are the jobs where uh, you needed only a high school degree or less and what was happening. And the, the height, the vertical axis, how many jobs were added, the horizontal axis, what they paid. So you can see a big uh, group in the middle in the 10 to $20 range, uh, food prep, cooks, freight and stock movers, uh, waiters and waitresses, secretary, a lot of jobs being added in those areas. The scary part about that are those are areas where you expect a lot of automation in the next few years. These are the people who just needed high school or less. Then the next group is places where you need, you don't need a degree, but you need more training after high school. And if you looked at where the changes are, big jump at the top in, uh, in heavy truck drivers, almost $25 an hour, but big numbers, computer support, uh, HVAC mechanics, medical assistance. Um, the ones below in red are where you're losing jobs that needed a technical uh, certificate. So uh, telecom equipment, home equipment installers for entertainment, I think it's easier than it used to be, some ATM repair stuff, but very few of the job areas that you're losing but some that you can see. This is where your technical schools or your community colleges or training programs would see where, uh, where extra training might be needed. And then finally, for places that where you needed an AA degree or a BA or higher over the last 10 years, over there in the far right, financial managers and lawyers making the most, uh, the, the highest growth area was post-secondary teachers, accountants and auditors, managers of all types. But a bunch of areas in the red where, uh, where business special uh, operators, chemists, computer programmers actually shrinking. 
And this will be a mix of the companies that you're attracting to the state or growing within the state. But these types of uh, individual charts show the areas where opportunities being created and what the skills and that training need to be for those opportunities. Finally, I wanted just to touch for you on what's happening with COVID-19. There's no doubt in, in our minds that there's gonna be a next new normal sometime we get to the light at the, at the end of this tunnel. And that next new normal is gonna dictate where opportunity is created in states. So the, uh, later today, in fact, there'll be new numbers for June release, but through May, uh, the numbers look uh, pretty devastating. The U.S. lost about 7% of its jobs. Delaware lost about 15% uh, initially. Some of those are temporary. They'll come back. And I think the biggest question that uh, economists are struggling with right now is whether or not, uh, you know, that the end of all of this, we're going to be down 5% of jobs, 10% of jobs, and we're going to get jobs back. And I think when you look at the uh, most of the reports out there, the consensus is that it'll be a while before we get all the way back to the record levels we were at in 2019. There were some trends that were happening before we started COVID-19 that are almost uh, guaranteed to still be happening through it and after it, uh, we get past this. The first is that everything's moving faster. Acceleration is one of those things that you can get any audience to agree on. I, I, if I ask you if you think things are gonna slow down any in the future, none of you are gonna say yes. So change is gonna happen even quicker. And one of the things that means is that industry disruptions are going to happen. And you know that some of that's happening in the middle of this and we'll talk about it, but we were talking about industry disruptions in 2019. We were talking a lot about what was happening in retail. We were talking a lot about what types of different technologies were changing uh, occupations. That's gonna continue and nothing is gonna change that. We were also talking a lot about talent wars, the fact that companies couldn't find enough quality, uh, enough quantity of people with the right qualitative skills. Um, so more people were unemployed. We were at record low unemployments before this started. So there will be more people in the pool, but the odds are that they will not have gotten new skills during the pandemic. And so we will still have shortages and, and great shortages in many areas. Specialty nurses will still be hard to find. Truck drivers will still be hard to find. Uh, mechanics will still be hard to find. There is a lot of talent wars that will continue. But five R's is what we call them that we feel pretty certain are actually gonna change our future. As we look forward, uh, Delaware is going to have to look at remote everything. Uh, so remote work looks like uh, partly is going to exist after this ends. Uh, again, a lot of surveys going on. Some businesses believe that they have uh, found a way uh, to cut their cost overall and maintain as much collaboration and efficiency as possible. Uh, everybody that's at home now isn't going to stay at home, but more work from home is likely to be there. And then We've also been trained. We've now had three months of on-the-job training on how to have our groceries delivered, how to do online banking, how to exercise at home, uh, how to do telemedicine, how to have more entertainment. So remote residues from uh, COVID-19 are going to change many of our industries. That's the first R. Uh, the second is whether or not people are gonna relocate from bigger, more dense places to less dense places. Um, this is another one of those trends that before uh, we started in 2019, people were moving out of New York. They were moving out of uh, Chicago and Los Angeles already. That's been accelerated. Now the question is, are they, are they moving out of bigger cities to mid-sized cities, or are they moving into more rural areas? Uh, is downtown still the darling, or with suburbia going to make a comeback? People tend to move to places that are safe, that have good health uh, care options, that housing is uh, available and affordable, and where they have good education opportunities. Uh, if that can happen in less dense places, then I would imagine there are going to be some choices that would allow, you know, communities in Delaware to be more attractive than pick your big place, whether it's Philadelphia or New York or wherever, and that you could attract, especially 
uh, workers that are slightly nomadic and can work from anywhere. Third R is robots. Uh, lots of robots in manufacturing over the last 10 years, but still behind the, the global average. You're gonna see manufacturing employ more robots. You're gonna see construction employ more robots. But differently, you're going to see a lot of robotics into healthcare, uh, into senior care, and into retail. Robots don't have to stay home during a pandemic, and they don't get sick. And being able to operate your facilities with minimal or no staff is going to be something people look at. Uh, a year or two ago, we heard about the first store uh, Amazon opened where there weren't any people in it. You went in, you, you know, used your device, you took what you wanted, it paid for itself. Uh, those stores aren't subject to changes in these types of uh, disruptions. And so I would expect the U.S. to see a huge jump in robots over the next two to three years. The fourth and one that you hear a lot about, it's a very optimistic uh, thing for all of us, is the idea of reshoring and creating redundancy of our supply chains. Uh, this is the opportunity slide, and there's going to be opportunity in America. Uh, biopharmaceuticals are going to reshore. Medical devices are going to reshore. Uh, everything related to defense in our food industry is likely to be more in the U.S., uh, but it's also going to be nearshoring, and so we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to compete with uh, Mexico and Canada for things because they're going to going to have advantages. Mexico still has about a 30 percent advantage in cost of labor, uh, but these are opportunities that states are already figuring out. How do we take advantage of this? What's what's our sweet spot? And so we expect that, and with that, there's going to be shorter supply chains and redundancy. I'll talk a little bit uh, in a minute, but this is one of those areas I think uh, Delaware has a huge advantage in. Uh, your total merchandise exports have been strong for a long time. This is the 10-year. Uh, not as much on non-manufacturing goods, but overall, your manufactured goods have, you know, have been stable through all of this. Your port is a huge asset for you. And when we look at the types of uh, manufactured exports, the durable goods side has continued to be about half of your overall. So those higher value durable goods are a key for what's going out of your ports. Uh, this is an opportunity for uh, a big uh, jump in the value that that port plays and how the manufacturers uh, in the community both attract through the redundancy of supply chains, their supply chains to her, to them, but also to strengthen the U.S. in terms of its ability to export to other parts of the world. And then the final R is just risk. Uh, when, when you're asked uh, what happens next, uh, how long does this last, when do we get back to normal, whatever that is, the business community is spending its life trying to manage whether or not a global pandemic with a global recession uh, unstable global politics, and there are lots of uh, definitions and, and examples of what's going on with our relationship globally, but also with just global politics in general. Our domestic politics this year, and being election year, there was always going to be that. And then re more recently, the polarization in the U.S. And, and equity discussions and other things. When you add all of those together, it creates risk for business. Business tends not to invest near as much in a risky climate. So, when you add those four R's together, they're going to dictate our future, and organizations are going to have to figure out how to compete within that. Just for me, for some final thoughts, uh, lots of different states are focusing on their future competitiveness now. We're helping more than a dozen in our firm, but states have, have uh, started with COVID-19 by figuring out how to deal with the health crisis, as they should. Uh, we're talking about people's lives now, uh, they're looking at it once we are reopened, what changed and what opportunities do we have to be more competitive? Uh, a lot of the factors will remain the same, but some things have changed. Uh, when you think about rapid change and you think about automation and you think about how people are going to uh, employ uh, new uh, automation in the future, financial service sector is one of those sectors that's really vulnerable to a lot of change. It is huge to your state, over 40% of your GDP. You need to be thinking about that. Your 10-year uh, job growth uh, includes occupations, the last 10 years, that are facing serious automation. 
whether that's food and beverage or production workers or others. So you're going to have a time where people are gonna to need to be retrained. They're gonna to have to have skills that are different. Some, even if they're in the same job, they're gonna be dealing with their interaction uh, with automation. Um, the areas that popped out to me as uh, most in need of discussion is uh, to focus on increased productivity, uh, opportunities in the industries of the future, uh, and your export and port strength. And then finally, uh, like any state, there are a lot of movers and, and shakers, lots of different things going on. If you can align around a future focus, if you can align around a plan to strengthen both the skills of your workforce and their productivity, but also the opportunity in industries that are going to be growing in the future and going to bring more wealth and higher paying jobs and stability and all the business strengths that, uh, that you're trying to get to, then that's the key for you going forward. Aligning those uh, individual factors, individual tasks, looking at it through the lens of someone from the outside considering investment is going to give you the most strength. So I really do appreciate the ability to be with you today. I think I'm going to talk with Mike a little bit more about Q&A and then later today uh, be part of uh, the Q&A with the, with the conference platform. That was just terrific. A uh, lot of great insights, a lot of uh, affirmation of things I think that we knew, uh, and then also some uh, bright lights on things that perhaps we didn't know. And that's, uh, that's why we needed to have this conversation. So thank you so much for all of that. Let's get into a couple questions that I have. You, you mentioned the region and you said that the entire mid-Atlantic has been doing some suffering um, or has some challenges. Um, share with me a little bit more about what, what that means. What, what do you think um, is the overall cause for that? I think the biggest thing is uh, when you look, when a company is looking for investment today, their biggest concern is can they get the talent they need? And, and I think Delaware is a state that has, you know, your, your workforce looks good on paper. You've got a lot of talent, but can you attract talent in big numbers is the real key. Um, I'm, I'm not going to use the specific example, but this last week, two of the states that I do work in, uh, one of them uh, had a major relocation from one of the other ones. And so both sides were calling me and uh, the, the head of the company just said simply that his entire reason for moving 6,000 jobs was he moved them to a place where people were moving, that they, you know, the population was growing. So I think the talent issue is the reason that parts of the Midwest and the Mid-Atlantic have not been growing as fast. Um, but I do think there's also legacy issues of business climate uh, that are important to those. And uh, as infrastructure gets tighter, uh, you have some real strengths in infrastructure, but do you, uh, you know, infrastructure is expensive to maintain and states are struggling with that. I think the other piece, last piece of it is just the mix of businesses. Some of the, the newer things are going to newer places and the legacy industries uh, are trying to shrink. Uh, mature industries try to figure out efficiency. It'll be a really interesting time over the next year to see, you know, we spent 20 years trying to get all the redundancy out of every business we possibly could to make them as efficient as possible. And now we're talking about redundancies and, and trying to make them less efficient. I don't know that we're actually going to get there in the long run. I think that uh, there's still a mix there where efficiency matters. But having older industries that are more established over time, they plateau their growth and they start culling away jobs as they automate and become more efficient. So I think all of those are, are factors. Thank you very much. There. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, let me let me talk about the tech sector for a moment because we just went through um, – uh, a situation we're still in it in part where uh, prior to the pandemic, 18% roughly uh, nationwide uh, retail shopping was online. Uh, it went, uh, it spiked, of course, for obvious reasons as people yeah. stayed home and uh, uh, accumulated that which they need or did some shopping uh, remotely as opposed to doing destination shopping. So 
tech is uh, enormously important. I have three kids in college. They all came home for spring break and they did not return to their respective universities and just school online. Um, so, and then there's the, there's the disruptions, there's the natural course of change. You talked about robotics, you talked about um, whether that's on the manufacturing floor, whether that's in education, uh, retail, uh, you name it. Um, tech is, as we have a session, tech is it. Um, it's critically important. You, you mentioned, and I want to ask you to be more specific about this, sure. this point, because I thought this was, this could be a solid to do for our members of the General Assembly, the governor, uh, the business community, the state chamber members, etc. Tax and regulatory systems that support tech growth explain what these specific to-dos are, please. You said that there are some specifics uh, on policies that would perhaps accelerate and help the growth of, of that sector, and we seem to be behind. So what are the specifics we should focus on? Yeah, so having not studied, I don't know if that's specifically your reason for being behind, but uh, some states are, you know, they have to do with the taxation on entrepreneurs, they have to do with uh, founder stock, they talk about uh, machinery and equipment taxes, and uh, all of those types of things matter to tech companies. Uh, free technology training for some companies matter. Uh, all, I mean, there's a long list and, uh, you know, we, I'd, I'd uh, refer you, we do tech studies every year for the state of North Carolina and talk about their, their tech analysis every year culminates in a conference that generates a, uh, uh, a lobbying platform. I mean, you know, they, they have a nicer word for it than that, I think, but uh, it's their public policy agenda every year. Uh, but we start with interviewing tech companies. What is it that allows you to uh, be here? What would you what would you do differently if you could? And so I think that a lot of it is around taxation and, and wealth, uh, but also machinery and equipment and advancement. I always go back to uh, one of the things that I did earlier in my career was the chief operating officer of the Research Triangle uh, area. And people ask, how did we get in the tech sector originally? And one of the reasons, one of the things that triggered it was that way back in the dark ages, supercomputers were pretty rare. And the state bought a Cray supercomputer and let tech companies use it because their individual companies couldn't, own, couldn't, couldn't afford it themselves. And the state just let them use it. And those little companies became big companies. And that's how you seeded that. So finding a policy agenda that allows technology companies to flourish is key. If you ask them, they're going to talk a, a lot about the, the high speed and ability to have remote workers. They're going to talk about the ability to attract workers, but they're also going to talk about the tax and regulatory issues. And uh, you should have a review of that. I think it could strengthen you. There's no reason for Delaware not to be a leader in technology, uh, but it currently is not. Perfect. Thank you. Um, you know, we have um, several other big industries, and you touched on some of these in your presentation, others uh, uh, not. And, and let me just see, see what um, uh, you might want to add in some of these uh, particular sectors. We, we have, as you know, a, a pretty robust ag sector, agribusiness, uh, which is dominated by poultry, uh, and then some of the, the row farmers, uh, corn and soybeans in particular. A lot of that gets used for actually feedstocks for uh, the food processing. Yeah. Right. Um, construction, uh, uh, a very robust construction sector. Uh, we do have some issues there. We've got retirements like every, every place has. We spent, a, as a society, spent a lot of years talking about, you know, people going to college as opposed to trade school. So we're seeing retirements and deficits in important trades. We've got some rules around uh, apprenticeships and journeymen that we need to look very hard at. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the banking and finance sector and how that's very vulnerable. It's important to us, but it's also very vulnerable to automation. And, and finally, um, uh, the health sector. Uh, Delaware, um, in the, one of the last census uh, uh, results that I saw, we were the uh, seventh oldest state in the union. Uh, we are a destination for retirees. Um, that creates both uh, some challenges 
for the business community. Uh, healthcare go, costs go up. We have older, uh, an older population. People use more healthcare in their sixth, seventh, eighth decades of life. Um, but that also then creates some job opportunities. So I just said an awful lot. Uh, any, anything there you want to react to on any of those sectors, I think our participants today uh, would be interested in your thoughts. So the construction sector came up in the GDP. Uh, it was one of the big movers. So you are concentrating construction jobs. That, uh, that really is going to put a uh, pressure or an opportunity on your schools locally and your apprenticeship programs to, to get more trades. Uh, the construction sector throttle around the country is the skilled trades. Uh, nobody can grow unless they can find the people with the specific skills. So that, that ability to do those training is important. I'll give you another example. Uh, you, you were talking about the technology sector. One of the states we work in is Missouri. Uh, Missouri just ended up with a DOL grant for 6,000 uh, technology apprenticeships targeted at cybersecurity and health uh, information. That's, I mean, to, to have, and the state chamber is running it, by the way, and there's uh, 6,000. Uh, it's a crazy number, but they realized that there was an opportunity there. I think that uh, you are in a unique position in finance because it's so important to your state. Uh, but in, as well as being the unique place, you need to be the leader. You need to be the person going to that next level. Uh, if you're going you're gonna to have automation, okay, embrace it. Get both the positives and negatives from it because automation typically creates more jobs than it loses. It loses jobs and some people are impacted. So reskilling and moving people up the chain, but also you should have the most innovative legislation in the country on finance. You have in the past, you've got a history of that. So you should do that as you move forward. Healthcare, um, as one of those people who've just entered that sixth generation, uh, uh, hopefully I, we push the healthcare out a little bit further, but uh, the issue with healthcare is gonna be the change. How do you manage cost versus automation versus where we head in the future. And, uh, you know, pandemics are a, a really interesting way to focus people on health issues. Uh, we noticed that very quickly. Last thing I would say, we didn't, we, the government sector overall GDPs come down a little, but there'll be impacts from COVID-19 on both state and local budgets. And so this is also a time for making really strategic choices because you won't have a lot of extra resources and in your government sectors to just try everything. So this is probably not a time where you want status quo or inertia to decide. You want to be strategic in what you do invest in, because if you stop investing altogether, while the people around you are still trying to invest, then you fall further behind. So having that strategic focus in each of these sectors and an economic strategy, your business climate is your business climate. It can have some nuance. But an overall sector strategy in your state uh, that is both geographic and sector specific is the key to getting further. And th there are states that do this very well. There are states who do it badly and are still doing well. So I don't want to make it sound like it's a, a panacea for everything. Uh, sometimes you just have good things. Uh, but, uh, but I think that uh, your state is small enough that you can bring leadership together and set a really straight course and, and uh, achieve what you're trying to do. So I would have a sector specific strategy uh, and uh, food processing is going to grow. Uh, the key to food processing is integrating the value added part of it, the uh, automation part, so that the individual worker salaries are maintained at a high enough level to make that a good job uh, to live in Delaware. Let's talk about uh, one of our speak. Let's talk about uh, trade and, uh, and and the Port of Wilmington because you mentioned that as an asset. One of our speakers at this conference was Eric Casey, the CEO of Gulf Tainer uh, USA here in Wilmington. Uh, they have a 50-year lease at the port, um, and they've got some pretty aggressive plans that our, our participants heard about earlier today. Uh, they finished, I believe, last year ranked as the 19th most active port in the country. Uh, Eric's mandate, 
uh, from his leadership is to make the Port of Wilmington a top 10 port in terms of traffic uh, before the end of the decade. So talk to me a, a bit about uh, the importance of uh, the port, uh, the strategic drivers. I also know, and I, and I, and I neglected to say this in, your, um, in, your, uh, in, in the opening about your bio, you ran the Southern Governors Association for a while. And so, you know, you're not um, tone deaf to uh, uh, the realities of politics and public policy. We're going to hear from our uh, Senate uh, President Pro Tem. We're going to hear from our Speaker of the House and uh, also from our Governor later today. Um, what are some things that also state government can do? So really kind of two pieces there, you know, focused on trade and the port, and then also uh, maybe some things strategically. You said big ideas. This is an opportunity for some structural reform. You know, uh, what, what might the state government think about uh, to help the private sector, but also maybe help themselves? Yeah, I ran the uh, Southern Growth Policy Board, which was the think tank for Southern governors, and I tried to stay out of the politics and spent my time on the competitive side of it. But as you know, lots of Southern ports are relatively new. Um, ports are going to change. I mean, we, we knew ports were going to have a different future uh, with the changes in the Panama Canal. But the geopolitics globally right now is probably going to have as much impact as anything. I think that uh, with nearshoring and reshoring, you're going to have more opportunities coming from Central and South America than you may have had you know, in the growth from Asia. So having a port that is going to be close by, redundant, uh, have the facilities for food storage, cold storage, uh, maintaining pharmaceuticals, all of that, I think really an opportunity. Uh, and, and your port is, is 19th biggest. It is not suffering, I don't think, from some of the largest ports problems right now where you, you really can't know when you're even going to get uh, your, your stuff offshored. Uh, so I, I think that there will be opportunities there. And I think the, the big opportunities are going to be in the change. Uh, you're going to see a lot of people changing their supply routes and what it is that, you know, their whole supply chain. So I think that's important. Uh, the best thing about a port is when it's supporting things that are local and, and helps overall with the, the clusters that you have in your community. So I think that will be part of it. Uh, state government uh, is going to have probably some reductions in uh, tax the taxes overall in the next couple of years, just by the nature of what COVID has done. Uh, they're going to have some opportunities through federal stimulus money to do things. Uh, again, it ought to be strategic, but uh, you know, in the short run, again, you're doing health things, but in the long run, it would be great if, uh, if the Delaware state government, and I, you know, I, I don't know your governor, so I'm not telling you exactly what to do, but uh, to focus on year two, three, four, ten, and what needs to be done to try to reseed an economy that at least some of the data would suggest uh, looking forward is going to be really important for you guys. That uh, if not, then once you get to a point where things have started to deteriorate, you don't have the competitive advantages that you currently have, it's a whole lot harder to get back up. Uh, maintaining and, and going from a position of strength uh, will be there. Talent's going to be key. Business climate's going to be key. Infrastructure is going to be key. Uh, those three things to focus on are, are what I would start with. And, uh, you know, a, a private public approach to this is going to get better results than an approach by either side. So working with the legislature and the governor, the business community, uh, and your major business groups, trying to figure out what y'all can do together that will move the needle on how competitive investors see you, I think is the key. Let's, uh, we've got time for just one or two more quick questions. I'm going to ask you a, a question and then uh, uh, ask you for any final thoughts and comments that you might have. You, know, you talked about relocation. Uh, relocation from big cities, that, that migration to medium or smaller size cities had already started in part prior to the pandemic. Um, but here we are today, and um, uh, there are people leaving some of the larger urban centers. Uh, we're in the shadows of the fifth biggest metropolitan area in the country, in Philadelphia. Uh, and, and, you know, in the not too distant uh, areas, of course, Baltimore and uh, Washington, D.C. Um, Wilmington. There's a 23% vacancy rate uh, in office space right now. Uh, 
uh, one of our panels today uh, is uh, uh, about um, how to reimagine uh, the office space in a pandemic. Uh, we had uh, one of our larger property owners and uh, managers on that panel, along with a representative from Gensler, which is a large, of course, international uh, office uh, design uh, and architecture firm. Um, and they talked about that. Uh, mention again, or, or highlight, you know, some of the things specifically that cities like Wilmington really need to be laser focused on. So um, I think I got in trouble last week doing a webinar uh, for uh, a bunch of city planners uh, because I said that uh, I thought that land use plans and regulations and uh, urban investments were going to be more critical in the next five years than any time in their careers. And they ought to take everything that is and open it back up and try to plan differently. Um, Cities today, in a, in a pandemic, cities have to still have mobility, and many of them did not. They still have to have open spaces, and some of them did not. Uh, they still had to have a way for services to be everywhere, and that made it really difficult. Uh, and that goes all the way down to cities of 25,000, that there's still a, a series of things that you have to be resilient about. Uh, for, I, I, Wilmington has an advantage in that it is not a tremendously vertical city. The density is such that you can move around. Uh, it's a pretty city. And so I think it can become an alternative for vertical. Vertical is tough because an elevator is an elevator. It is really hard to get away from your neighbors in an elevator. Uh, but uh, cities still have to function and they will still be places for families that want to live. So you'll have to have some mid-density within the city. Uh, I don't think people are, are going to run away from services. Uh, they still want good schools. They still want health care that works for them. They still want entertainment options. Uh, I don't see the American public as just holed up in a suburban house for the rest of their lives watching a big screen TV and playing in the backyard. I think that we, we passed that. Uh, that was a that was fun in the 50s and probably isn't the view of the future. So I think it is a time for cities to, uh, you know, there's a thing about 20 years ago called zero-based budgeting where everybody said, Let, if we were just starting from scratch, what would we do? And I think it's a time from a planning standpoint to say, here are my assets. Here are the things that were problems during the last 2020. Um, and here is a different way of looking forward and what we could do. Uh, I know I sound like I want people to plan more, but you're at a time where many things are changing. And if you ask your citizens, do they think, do they think things are gonna stay the same? They'd say no. So now how do you anticipate? How do you do scenario planning for if this, we should do that? And uh, I think that uh, your size can be a huge advantage in that, you know, we, we refer to uh, your type of area as a retail area. People know each other. They can build relationships. They can make changes quickly. Uh, you know, I think that's what you take advantage of. And elected officials with vision for what they want to see 10 years, 20 years out in the future are going to be the ones that uh, we're going to value. Thank you, Ted. Um, let me thank you very much. Uh, I know your slide presentation will be available to our participants and uh, you're going to make yourself available for uh, specific questions uh, from uh, several uh, participants and I'm grateful for all of that. Um, any final thoughts, comments, any major takeaways or insights that you just want to either reinforce? I, I, I loved the slide personally about the, I think it was 15 factors that tend to be the common things that site selectors look at and the grouping that talked about talent. Um, because, you know, this whole theme of this conference is putting Delawareans back to work. And um, one of our presenters um, uh, from uh, Oregon said, uh, shared a statistic, uh, Lisa shared a statistic and said, 80% um, uh, of industry's employment needs 
within this decade or as we get to the end of the decade are going to be uh, found from the existing workforce. And in only 2% of uh, the workforce is added to every year by high school, technical school, or college graduations. So when you wrap your head around that, it really suggests that while educating K through 12 is important and um, you know who we're putting in the workforce that's a younger person is important, but boy, the huge uh, opportunity is for those states that address the needs of the existing workforce, whether it's uh, as Ron Painter from the National Association of Workforce Development Boards talks about micro badging, uh, these smaller, you know, quick programs to help keep the workforce uh, focused, trained, up to date, et cetera. Anything else you want to add before we close out? Ron and I have been friends for 30 years. And uh, my, Ron, actually, well, we now talk about quantifying credentials. And uh, I think I, I heard him use micro badging first almost 20 years ago. It's, it's the right thing. Uh, we do talk a lot about what do we do to get a 18-year-old work experience. And it's terribly important. But what do we do for a 40-year-old that needs retraining is just as important because uh, even in a, a optimistic world, that 40-year-old has 25 years more work, and we need them to be productive. And I, I mentioned in my uh, my talk, and it's something that people don't like to hear, that older workers get less productive, um, and it's because they're not learning the new tricks. And so, retraining mid-career workers is a huge key as we move forward. And uh, so I think that that puts the onus on systems, on how we fund, how we invest in our community colleges and our technical schools, um, and how we, we all want accountability, um, but accountability has to have flexibility in it uh, to meet needs. And so I, I'm a big fan that we, uh, the very first thing you do when you're trying to solve a problem is you ask a lot of people who are stakeholders what the problem is and try to define it, it's called naming and framing. You try to define it. And then once you've come up with a list of things to try to fix it or address it, you ask them again, if I do this, will that help? And if the answer isn't an immediate yes, then go back and start over because we do a lot of things that actually don't help. So uh, uh, I, uh, I th appreciate being with you, uh, being asked to be part of this. I wish I was in Delaware today. I understand it's 70 something and it's close to a hundred here. So, uh, it would, have been, it would have been nice to be there today, and uh, I hope I get the chance to come up and visit with you and uh, your whole team sometime soon. But thank you again. Ted, thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, one of our uh, uh, valued members is uh, uh, of the state chamber is Jim Perdue, and Jim is fond of saying, uh, that which gets measured gets fixed. Um, this has been a very uh, wonderful, uh, insightful uh, session. We've been listening and, and, and having a, a great conversation with Ted Abernathy. He's the Managing Partner of Economic Leadership in Raleigh, North Carolina. Ted, thank you again. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it.